Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. We closed the last video with the issue of levels of adequacy in determining whether or not our grammars, our hypotheses, are good or not. The final level of adequacy we talked about was explanatory adequacy, in which we are required to explain real-world data, our judgments, and also to try and get at why language looks the way it is, and how we come to know the things that we know. If we're really interested in explanatory adequacy, we're going to have to ask the question, how did we get our syntactic knowledge? In this unit, we're going to briefly explore the idea that some amount of knowledge comes from an innate universal grammar that all humans come equipped with. Now, there are some challenges to this. We first of all have to figure out what um, what is part of this universal grammar and what is part of some language-specific rules. And we're going to have to figure out why it's possible that we speak different languages if we're all equipped with an innate universal grammar. Before we delve into the issue of universal grammar, I do want to make one little terminological distinction. Um, first of all, I want to talk about the difference between learning and acquisition. Learning is where you gain some kind of knowledge using conscious means. Acquisition is where you gain some kind of knowledge using subconscious means. So, for example, chemistry and linguistics are things you learn. But the evidence seems to suggest that languages are best acquired rather than learned. Other examples of things that you might acquire might be, uh, might be walking or uh, learning to dance. You don't consciously think about them, you just do them. Um, it seems like small children seem to acquire languages uh, rather than learn them. They do it effortlessly. They don't actually think about what they're doing, they just try to learn the language. Adults, by contrast, who try to learn a language in a classroom often don't do so, so successfully. Uh, they are rarely fluent Whereas adults who try to learn a language through um, uh, acquisition rather than learning, so they go and they live with people and speak the language daily, are much more successful. So we have this distinction between learning and acquiring. We're mainly going to be talking about acquiring languages here. So before we consider a hypothesis like universal grammar, it's worth thinking about um, some other views of how we might uh, acquire the syntax of language. Uh, one common view is that we are instructed by our parents. Another common view is that we simply mimic the behavior of our parents. So uh, let's address both of those issues in turn. Um, there are good reasons to think that both of those things are wrong. Uh, one reason is because um, mimicking is not a good solution because we actually produce and understand sentences that we've never heard before. And that is not what we would expect if language was merely mimicry. Uh, similarly, we know things about our language that A, we've never been exposed to, and B, we certainly have never been instructed on. So let's pursue both of those topics uh, before we consider what universal grammar might look like. So let's start with a, a, a very important challenge to these kinds of hypotheses. It turns out that we've discovered that you know things about your language that you've never been taught, and actually you could not have acquired simply by mimicking. So let's take the sentence, who do you think Sean hit? Now we also have the sentence, who do you think that Sean hit? Now, the second sentence is a little awkward, but it's just as equally grammatical as the first one. So what conclusion might we draw 
about the presence of the word that. One obvious solution is to say that in English, words like that are optional when you're embedding one sentence inside of another. So we have the sentence, Sean hit something, uh, and that's embedded under think. And then we turn that into a question. Uh, and you can either have the word that, or you can leave it off. Now the problem comes uh, if we extend this to when we question not the object, as in these first two sentences, so um, the object of the verb hit is who, but the subject of the verb hit. So it's certainly the case that when you say, who do you think hit Bill, that you can leave off the word that. And that's perfectly consistent with the data in the first two sentences. But the problem comes if we try to put the word that in. Who do you think that hit Bill? It's terrible. It's not a good sentence of English. Why should that be the case? Well, first of all, you were never taught this fact. Nobody ever told you this, yet you know it if you're a native speaker. Secondly, there's no way you could have guessed it or mimicked it. Because in the first two sentences, which um, are sentences you might have heard as a kid, you can see that sometimes the word that is there and sometimes it isn't. So it's a logical conclusion then that the word that is optional. It can either be there or not. But what's surprising is that when you do the question of a subject, you have to leave off the word that. You can't put it in. And there's no way you could have deduced this simply by the data you might have heard. Because you never hear anybody say the ungrammatical sentence, and you never hear anybody saying, no, that's not right. So the conclusion we can draw from this is you know things you've never been taught and that you couldn't have deduced from the data around you. Consider the, the sentence, Susan thinks Bill loved a chimp. Now, I'm going to play fast and loose with the words think and wonder. They mean roughly the same thing, but they differ in whether or not the embedded clause can take a question word as the first word in it or not. Um, so we're going to go back and forth between think and wonders, but uh, essentially it's the same thing. So you can say, uh, Susan thinks Bill loved a chimp. You can also ask the question, uh, you can also state the statement, Susan wonders what Bill loved. So you can take the object of an embedded clause, turn it into a question word like what, and move that question word to the beginning of that embedded clause. Now, you can also turn the subject of that embedded clause into a question word. And you can say, who did Susan think loved a chimp? So here what you've done is you've taken Bill, turned it into a question word, and then you move it to the beginning of the very, uh, the very beginning of the sentence. Who did Susan think loved a chimp? Now notice both the second and third sentences are grammatical here. Susan wondered what Bill loved is fine, and who did Susan think loved a chimp is also fine. But what's really surprising is you can't do both of these. So you can't say, who did Susan wonder what loved? This is word salad for most native speakers of English. Why should that be the case? Both of the operations that created sentence number two and sentence number three are legitimate. Why is it that you can't do both of them? Again, this is something that you could not have learned. And it's also something that you could not have deduced just by listening to your parents. So it's clearly the case that we know things about our language that we could not have mimicked and we could not have learned. So that suggests that language might be an instinct. That is, it's born into us as an innate object which we might call a universal grammar. The idea that some parts of our syntactic system are innate or an instinct is due to Chomsky. It's one of the basic founding premises of generative grammar. Now, you might be saying to yourself, how is it possible that language would be an instinct, and yet we all speak different languages. French seems very different from English. Uh, Swahili seems very different from French. 
How could it be the case that we have different languages if we're born with some innate knowledge of grammar? But think for a moment about other things that are innate parts of us. Take, for example, eyes. Eyes come in all sorts of different colors. They come in different shapes, and they come with different abilities. So, for example, uh, I need to wear glasses because I don't see as well as some other people. So, it follows then that we can have variation within a system that is built into us. Um, most people have uh, eyes, and most people can see, although there are many who cannot. And there's variation in both uh, how well those eyes work and what they do, and in their color and shape and uh, functionality. Now, um, let's turn that discussion around to languages. Remember, in the last video, we talked about the difference between e-languages and i-languages. So let's distinguish between particular languages, that is e-languages, and the ability to speak languages, so i-language. It's a very important distinction. We want to distinguish between English and French and Swahili and Gaelic from our innate ability to, to speak languages, to construct sentences in languages. So one of these things are e-languages, and the other is your i-language, or internal language. Now the claim Chomsky made is not that particular languages, or e-languages, are innate. That makes no sense. That's crazy. Instead, what he was claiming was that at least some part of your i-language is innate. So there are certain building blocks that all humans are, are born with that allow them to produce and understand sentences. That thing is innate. But the actual instantiation of that may vary. So let's put some uh, technology behind this. We're going to propose something called parameters. Now, parameters are essentially the things that differ. Uh, between languages. So words differ, so the words of French and the words of Gaelic are different, so those things are going to be different. And also, the basic word order in those languages is different. So for example, in Irish, you put the verb first, then the subject, then the object. But in French, you put the subject first, then the verb, then the object. So we're going to talk about those levels of variation in terms of parameters. The settings of parameters are acquired. Those are things that you have to learn. So when you're a little baby learning Irish, you learn you put the verb first. And when you're a little baby learning French, you learn that you put the subject first. So those things are acquired. But the basic building blocks out of which you construct those things, notions like subject and verb, have to be innate. Um, Let's be really clear. A particular language is not innate. But the basic tools you have for constructing languages is. So the parameters themselves, not their settings, are innate. You're going to have a set of parameters that you can use. But um, the way in which you set those parameters is going to vary depending upon what language you speak. So having made that distinction between the part of your linguistic system that is inborn and the parts which can vary, we're able to propose something called universal grammar. Universal grammar is the idea that a large part of what we use to construct sentences is built in. Where, uh, however, there are parts of it that require specific linguistic input like whether you're hearing French or hearing Gaelic, as to set the parameters that we're going to use that distinguish between languages. Now, there's lots of different arguments for and against universal grammar. Let me give you a couple of the ones that you might find in the literature about evidence for universal grammar. Uh, one uh, piece of evidence is that it seem that syntax seems to be specific to humans or at the, at the outside, uh, very closely related um, 
animals. Uh, it, we can identify parts of the brain that are specific to syntax. Um, we can notice that when children are acquiring languages, they do so in very sort of similar ways and similar orders. Uh, we can observe that um, real language acquisition does not involve overt instruction. We can also observe that there are properties of language that are universal among all languages. And we'll come back to those later in this, in this series of videos. So, to sum up, what we've argued for here is that some parts of language have to be innate. They involve information that you cannot have learned and you cannot have mimicked. So, what we've had to do is propose that there's a universal grammar something that is innate and inborn. Uh, we're able to explain the fact that languages differ from each other by making use of the notion of parameters. So within the universal system, there's sets of uh, information that, that require input from specific languages.